You're listening to The Nourished Child, episode number 94, a 2016 Journal of Pediatric Study of Children ages 9 to 14 years found that over half of girls and boys were dissatisfied with their body shape. A growing body of research identifies the prevalence of body dissatisfaction in children. In a society that's focused on health, body size, weight, and shape, it can be challenging as a parent to raise a child who is happy in the skin she or he is in. Today, I have guest Rebecca Scritchfield on the show. She is the author of Body Kindness and a registered dietitian who lives and works near Washington, D.C. Today, we're chatting about what body dissatisfaction exactly is, why children are unhappy with their bodies, and what are the factors that are contributing to poor body image or body dissatisfaction in children. We'll also cover the steps that parents can take when their children are young, encouraging body diversity, what to do with bullying, and any kind of negative self-comments. This episode is a must-listen for all parents of kids, so I hope you enjoy it. You can find today's show notes and all the links that we mention over at jillcastle.com forward slash 094. That's 094 for episode number 94. Let's cue that music. Welcome to the Nourish Child Podcast, a show about childhood nutrition, feeding kids, and dealing with the ups and downs of growing a healthy child. Here's your host, registered dietitian and childhood nutrition expert, Jill Castle. Hey there, welcome back. If this is your first time to the Nourish Child Podcast, welcome, welcome. If you're an avid, loyal listener, welcome back. I'm glad to have you here. I think you're really going to enjoy this show today. Rebecca is a great interview. She's got a lot to say about body diversity, body kindness, and we'll dig into all the issues around body dissatisfaction and body image issues in children. But before we get going, I wanted to read a nice comment from a listener by the name of Brenna. She says, I recently heard your interview on dishing up nutrition and have been really enjoying reading your blog and listening to your podcast. You have compiled an amazing amount of resources that are just incredible. I also find them very relatable and realistic. Thank you, Brenna, so much. I did get interviewed on the Dishing Up Nutrition podcast on the topic of picky eating. It was actually a live radio interview and they also air it as a podcast. I'll include the link to that podcast in the show notes in case you want to go over and listen in. I also wanted to just announce that next week or the week of October 8th and 9th, I will be airing a workshop, a live workshop for healthcare professionals. So if you're a dietitian, an occupational therapist, speech language pathologist, feeding specialist, even parenting expert or mental health counselor, I am hosting a two-hour live workshop called Profit Pillars, Five Pathways to a Profitable Healthcare Business. And in that workshop, I'm going to take the attendees through five different pillars that they can anchor their business in so that they continue to be successful and to grow. Because the truth is, if we're not making money in our business, we aren't helping anybody because we can't keep our business going. So I want to demystify that. And this is really for healthcare practitioners who have either just started their own business or who are seriously thinking about it. And this workshop will really just give you a vision or a big idea of what a profitable business could look like. It doesn't have to be a one-on-one private practice. There are a lot of different ways that you can expand your business and be profitable while also helping others. So that's next week as I record this. So October 8th and 9th, it is a live workshop. However, if you register and you can't make it, there will be a recording that goes out after it's all over. And this week, I had the absolute joy to present my nourished workshop to 
250 school nurses in the New York City area. And they actually have 1,200 school nurses, I believe is what I heard, in that area. So I was able to present to 250 of them at the Healthy Choices Conference. It was sponsored by the American Dairy Northeast Organization. I was their workshop leader for the morning. And boy, we had a lot of fun. It was a hoot. And I really enjoyed taking these ladies and gentlemen through the different parameters of what I see child nutrition as food, feeding, and development. So it was a lot of fun. Let's get into the mailbag before we get into the interview with Rebecca. This is from Bethany in New York City. She says, I am a regular listener to your podcast and I am a huge fan of the show. Every time I tune in, I know I can trust the knowledge and wisdom you so thoughtfully deliver. I have to say, my favorite part of every episode is actually your sign-off. I smile every time I hear you remind me to give the child in my life a loving squeeze today, which is perhaps, in the end, the best advice. I am writing today to ask for a personal bit of advice. My six-year-old son's first grade teacher has started using candy as an incentive for good behavior in the classroom. I feel that this practice is undermining my efforts at home. I recently browsed your podcast archive and re-listened to episode number 31, and boy, did it ever resonate with me this time around. I want the food rewards to stop, but I am unsure of how to approach the teacher in a respectful way. However, I sympathize with how challenging it must be to manage the behavior of nearly 30 kids for the duration of a school day. I only have two to deal with and am at times overwhelmed with just them. Yes, we can all empathize with that. I was wondering what I should do. What would you do? So I think my best advice, there's a lot of different things that you can do. You can get mad, you can get sad, you can go on the attack, you can send a nasty email. That's not my favorite. None of those things are my favorite way to deal with something like this. I think that I would approach it from an angle of curiosity and I would ask the teacher if there's another way to help children behave. And I might even offer some suggestions like if she wants to use a reward-based incentive or she wants to incentivize young children, are there other things that she could be using, particularly non-food rewards? We do know from the research that food rewards, when we use them, complicate things. They shift the hierarchy of how children think about food, particularly if you're using sugary sweets and treats. So I would ask, you know, is there another way? I would also suggest some ideas with non-food rewards or offer to brainstorm with her some different rewards that don't involve food. Perhaps it's, you know, 10 stars on a chart and you get extra time at recess or five times on a chart and you get to be the class leader for the day. You get the idea. We don't have to use candy. And I agree with you, managing 30 kids for a whole day can be really challenging. And I also know that food and treats and sweets are motivating for children. But in the long run, it is not good to tie food rewards to behavior or bribing children to do the things we want them to do with candy. So, and then the last thing is you can talk to your son and you can talk to him about when it's okay to have treats and sweets. You can talk through the situation. You don't necessarily, he's pretty young. You don't necessarily need to go down the lecture route with him, but you can identify and outline sort of what your family beliefs are around healthy food balance. And sweets and treats aren't bad. They sure taste great, but there is a time and place for them. And every day at school can get out of control. So I hope that helps, Bethany. Thank you so much for writing in to the show. I invite any of you out there, if you do have questions like that, go ahead and send them along. I'll try and get to them on the show. I'm not so good at replying by email because it takes me a lot of time to type those answers out, but I'm happy to pop them on the show and answer a question from the mailbag. So send them on in if you like. 
So today's show notes, you can get them at jillcastle.com forward slash 094 for episode 94. I'll have the links to that archive about sweets and treats in there. And I'll also have the Dishing Up Nutrition interview in there as well. So let me introduce to you Rebecca Scritchfield. You'll really enjoy this show. She's a treat. She's extremely passionate about her book, her topic, her expertise. She is a voice we need around this area. And I think that for some of you, your eyes will be wide open like, wow, hadn't thought about this stuff before. Others of you might be familiar with her. So I know you'll enjoy listening to this interview. But Rebecca Scritchfield is a well-being coach, registered dietitian, nutritionist, ACSM Certified Exercise Physiologist and author of the book, Body Kindness, Transform Your Health from the Inside Out and Never Say Diet Again, which Publishers Weekly calls a rousing guide to better health and the New York Times book review calls simple and true. Through her weight-inclusive body kindness counseling practice, Rebecca helps people reject diets and body shame to create a better life with workable, interesting self-care goals to fit individuals' needs and preferences, not society's unrealistic weight and beauty standards. Rebecca has influenced millions through her writing, podcast, workshops, and appearances in over 100 media outlets, including NBC Nightly News, CNN, The Today Show, O Magazine, Real Simple Time, and many others. Rebecca is a freelance writer for the Washington Post and Self Magazine, an advisor to Health Magazine, and Diversified Dietetics, and a mom of two young girls. She lives in the Washington, D.C. area where she was recognized as one of 10 super mom entrepreneurs in the nation's capital. So snuggle up, sit tight, grab your coffee, your tea, go for a walk, whatever you do when you're listening to this podcast, but settle in, you're in for a good ride. Here's Rebecca. Hey, Rebecca, welcome to The Nourished Child. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm thrilled to have you on the show because we're going to talk about body kindness for kids. And we had an opportunity, or I had an opportunity to interview you for an article that I wrote, which I'm going to link into the show notes here. But it is such an important topic. And I know just, you know, working with children and their parents that this is a topic that parents get really uncomfortable with. So I want to unpack some of what is, you know, what's going on with body dissatisfaction in kids, how we can teach them to be more kind, and how parents can really help move the needle on acceptance of and body diversity and all of those things that we'll talk about. But before we get started, I always love to give my guests the opportunity to tell us about yourself and your journey to how you got into this work. Sure. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to have this conversation today. So I am based in Washington, D.C. I have a private practice here where I really help people enhance their well-being at any size. They can have any medical condition or an issue with chronic pain. And I want to help people with whatever is going on, help them create a better life. And so that means we're going to focus on the big picture of our well-being of course, those things that we do to take good care of ourselves on a daily basis, whether it's what we eat or how we can move our bodies in meaningful ways, sleep and all those things that you might think of. But even in the bigger picture of how we can grow our happiness in our relationships or find more meaning in our life, whether it's through volunteering or remembering that we're all humans. And part of what really makes our life beautiful and wonderful is through positive connections that we can have with one another. So they might say, I've got to do something about this weight, or I have, I've got one child who seems to always be hungry and one who is very active and I can't seem to get interested in, in foods. And so they'll bring the these problems that, you know, that, that are real and practical and important to resolve. But no matter who comes in, I am listening and just really trying to help them solve their problem, but also think a little bit differently about what does it even mean to have a positive well-being throughout our lives. And I think that's really important because in our culture, we can often think in silos, like, 
your health is determined by your appearance, or you can only be healthy if you eat all the vegetables or something like that. And so there's a lot of unlearning and relearning that we have to do. So I, I really take a lot of joy and pride in that. About half of my clients are kids and families. And some of my families have eating disorders, right? So we're trying to, you know, really help tackle serious mental health issues with, with folks who might be listening, who, who are struggling with an eating disorder and who are somewhere in recovery there, know that you, that you are not alone and big empathy to parents who are listening because often they'll wonder like, did I cause this or did I, did I do something wrong? And so I'd want anyone to know, look, that parents don't cause eating issues in, in their kids, but we can absolutely be part of the solution for that. And just briefly on my own journey, you know, I feel like I'm a product of diet culture myself. So like most kids, I tried my first diet before the age of 10. I really thought it was best intentions. It was like the thing you do to be healthy. And I played around with a lot of, you know, diets that I found in magazines, which thankfully I don't think, you know, many kids read all those social media is just as, as bad. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. I just got all the, you know, good intentions, but really wrong messages about, you know, it was about lean legs and certain number of calories that, that were really actually inadequate for where I was in growth and development. And so I did struggle with my body image, like most kids end up doing at some point in their teens. And I thought, you know, at the, at, at the same time, while I struggled with my body image, I also had this like passion for, wow, like your heart's going to be until one day it doesn't. Like, that's amazing. What can I do to care for my heart? So I do think there was this element of truly deeply caring about health. It was just the wording that I got for what that meant was twisted up in appearance and beauty. And so besides being a registered dietitian, I also am a certified exercise physiologist. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I really want to help people with both of those components. And I think where it where I finally landed on body kindness was having this rock bottom moment where I realized I've tried all these different diets, even after becoming a dietitian, you know, I'll just admit that. I think that a lot of people think that when they're in the room with an expert, that they're in the room with someone who's never made a mistake, who's never mm, taken yeah. a wrong turn. Even as a dietitian, I was trying yeah. different diets. And ultimately I realized that what I was doing was not helpful for myself or my clients. And and when I created the body kindness philosophy, it was, it was really like I had one question on my whiteboard, which is what do I do if I'm never going to diet again? And eventually the philosophy was born from there. Mm -hmm. And you said you hit rock bottom. What did that look like? So there were a lot, a lot of things that were going on it for me personally, so I, there was a time when I was doing marathons and ultra marathons and running actually helped me create an appreciation for my legs, which was the body part that I always bash. I mean, my inner critic would roar. I mean, from 10 plus look at your legs and, you know, just all the mean things you can imagine. I said, but then when I got into running, I could learn to frame this appreciation for what my body could do. Right. And then somehow I'd end up twisting it. Well, if I'm going to prove myself as a dietitian runner, I need to have a fast time. And, and where did that even come from? At hindsight's 2020, but I decided very stupidly that I needed to drop some weight while I was marathon training. And so I was doing South Beach, which if you know anything about it, it's like in the beginning, don't you dare eat fruit, you know, right, <laughs> which is right. like runners for two weeks. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, so, and again, I had the knowledge, like as a sports dietitian, that didn't matter. It was this emotional pull for my worthiness. And that marathon where I I was basically cutting carbs and training up in miles and ignoring just all the things you're supposed to do. I collapsed somewhere between mile 25 and 26. It was a Marine Corps marathon. But all I remember, like I remember the wheels kind of coming off and just, you know, just sort of speeding up when I heard in my caregiver mind, slow down or anywhere. It went black and I collapsed and I woke up in this ice bath very, you know, delirious at, you know, for example, it was Marine Corps marathon. So there's all these Marine doctors surrounding me. And my first words were, are you guys interns? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. And, you know, they're like, no, ma'am, we're doctors. And, and then someone's on the radio saying that they can't find my husband. And I was like, my husband's right here. And I'm pointing to this like male Marine next to me. And he's like, ma'am, I'm not your husband. And it was, it was funny because I remember them laughing, but trying not to laugh. But and anyway, very seriously, a doctor doctor said, you know, three runners saved your life. Mm. You know, my body temperature went to 107. 
Oh my gosh. Yeah. It was not a particularly hot day. It was really a case of not listening and not connecting to my body. And I cried. I mean, I really do think it was a traumatic experience. I said I I would never run again. And then, you know, I had a good friend who said, you have to slay the dragon. You have to face your fears. And I ended up going on to run over 15 marathons and ultras, but like with compassion, you know, but for me, that was in my personal case. It was like, look at everything you've been through. Dieting has never been the answer. And it was, I literally, didn't know the answer to that question. How do you help a person who has a concern about their weight or who has a concern about their body? Or, you know, what I find, what I've learned is that we say we're concerned about our weight or we're concerned about our health and that we must lose weight to improve those things. And that's the big mistake. And, you know, in addition to that, my own experience, my mom was a chronic dieter and you know, I think this is a very appropriate idea to bring up because as parents, we do want to set our kids on a path. And at the same time, we still might be struggling with things ourselves. And so we never really feel adequate or equipped, or we want to, you know, we want to do what's right. And sometimes we don't have the answer and very much so parents can model these behaviors toward our kids. So I just want to be super encouraging, no matter where you're at right now, that you can make positive changes in your own life, and it will have a significant impact on your kids life. And that's really what you want to do to kind of break the chain in that scenario. You know, but in in my own mom's chronic dieting, she had significant weight cycling in, in her life and still dealt with health issues that were related really to a lot of stress, anxiety, overwhelm, and, and just a, a lack of grounded well-being in her life. So she really struggled with a lot of emotion regulation, a lot of emotional eating. But the, but dieting was always her answer, which actually led to her to create this primal hunger that then created these uncontrollable eating behaviors. And so it, it, it was, you know, watching her health deteriorate and blaming the chronic dieting was big for me too. It was like she never had a solid foundation or a plan what do I do if I accepted my body as it was right now, but stayed committed to taking good care of it? And, you know, and this is even if you wish it looked different, right? Or even if you hope, you know, I I think that's something that we should get into is that it's, it's not really about, oh, I can't do body kindness because I want to lose weight. It's, if you think about, of course, people want to have a rock and bod for the beach, or they want to lose weight, or, you know, like they have these mixed emotions of things, because look at the messages we're given by our culture. So, you know, I really want to encourage people to say it, it's separate what you want from what you feel in your heart sounds like good self-care. And just by doing that, you're already practicing body kindness without even knowing the philosophy or reading the book, like you're already in the right direction there. Right, right. So Rebecca, a growing body of researches has identified that, you know, body dissatisfaction in children is growing. Mm -hmm. There was one study in the Journal of Pediatrics of children, you know, school age to middle school, early teen years that found over half of the girls and the boys were dissatisfied with their body shape. So Mm -hmm. let's unpack this a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like for the listeners out there, what is body dissatisfaction Mm -hmm. in a nutshell? Yeah. So it's when you make a judgment about your appearance, right? So it could be anything. I don't like my nose. You know, I don't like my face. It could be about the size or shape, you know, so specific to body fat. Like I think my belly is too round or, you know, but essentially it's a judgment about something about your appearance. There are certain things that are developmentally appropriate, right? So like both of my kids the first time I heard them say the word fat, they were three. It was, it was very playful, right? They poked at their bellies and they poked at my belly and they're like, fat, 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 fat. And so, you know, and of course, as, you know, as a mom, I was just like, oh, I don't want them thinking anything bad about their bodies or anyone else's body. So how do I help them for a three-year-old? you know, understand what I want them to believe about fat. As you get older, like I mentioned earlier, most kids try at least some type of diet by 10. And this is because from the age of one, our brains are like sponges absorbing messages and a lot of the negative messages. And again, it's not that any one person or a life event causes issues, but if you think of anything that's said in the room, so if a well-meaning caregiver might say, 
oh, look, you can eat cheese, but I can't because that would make me fat, you know, or I need to diet to be healthy. Words that people say, what people do, not only on social media, but even in schools. I'm sure you have a horror story of something that happened in your child's school, but it already happened to my daughter in kindergarten. I'm pushing her in the grocery cart one day, just picking up some odds and ends. And she goes, mom, why uh, why are cheeseburgers junk food? And I was like, huh? What? <laughs> you know, wasn't expecting that kind of question in kindergarten and unravel to this whole thing where the gym teacher had a PowerPoint lesson that was required by the DC public schools. And we ended up having a meeting. You know, I approached the whole thing with kindness and we're going to move forward in a positive direction. I'm going to volunteer in the school to help make a difference there. Ultimately, he showed me the spreadsheet that said, basically teach the kids about the difference between healthy food and junk food and not giving him real resources. So he had this PowerPoint that had junk food and had like sodas, cheeseburgers, fries, and all these other things. And really what he was teaching is just this moralizing of individual foods. And as we know in our work that we could do just such a hot button area, it's like, yes, I think we want the schools to be involved in our children's well-being, but I would question are we giving the right people the right resources based on evidence so that we really stop doing harm? And I'm always thinking about the highest weight kid in the classroom. If we're creating content that helps and supports the highest weight kid with the or you know the child with the most body dissatisfaction, the most sensitive child, we're helping everyone else in between. So it's how helpful are these BMI report cards that some schools still do? You know, is that really helpful to the families, regardless of what the states need to collect data? You know, I would even question, do we even need to say that childhood obesity is a bad thing? Why are we labeling and pathologizing a child's growing body? And, you know, regardless of the health conversation, should we not look at every child, regardless of their weight, and help every child get access to delicious, affordable, and good for you foods on a regular basis, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. And teaching them the healthy habits of living a healthy life, yeah. you know, whether, whatever that looks like. Right, but, right. You know, right. Like without the shame of, oh, I like chocolate milk over white milk. Oh, yeah. I need to be shamed. And maybe it's we can in a family help them work on, you know, I, I just love the words healthy eating patterns because, mm-hmm. you know, like the word health and healthy eating doesn't bother me, but I think where we get into problems is when we go to the moralizing of individual foods. If we can think of things as like a pattern and balance, we're in a much better direction. Yeah. I mean, I I feel like in so many of the interactions I have, you know, celebrities, people, professionals, they focus on the food as the, you know, the cause of the problem. And as you've so eloquently said earlier, a lot of our lack of well-being is rooted in our emotions, is rooted in our personality, our temperament, how we are raised, what we're surrounded by in terms of our environment. I mean, yes, a little bit of it can be partly food. But when you look at the big picture, to me, it's less about food. It's it's more about all of these other things that I think we get stuck when we demonize foods and elevate other foods. And it, it just gets to be problematic. And kids are so developmentally, they're they're black and white thinkers. You tell them something's bad, they believe it's bad. You tell them something's good, they believe it's good. That messaging can be really, really challenging for children. So, you know, when you think about these, you know, this growing concern of body dissatisfaction, more and more kids are, are dissatisfied with their bodies. What factors do you really believe are rooting that issue, that growing issue? I know you talked about, you know, schools Mm -hmm. and society culturally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I think in a lot of ways, it's just parents don't know what to say to be helpful, right? Because like, like, for example, there was a great study that came out in 2018, and it was called the intergenerational transmission of parents encouragement to diet. And essentially what they found is like the way that I process it, it's like dieting spreads like a virus through generations, right? Like you catch the bug. And I mean, if we think about it, like we are products of our upbringing and we do the best we can, but we've got the tools that we have that are part of our upbringing where the culture was. And what this study ended up saying is that it passes, these dieting behaviors pass through 
three generations. So if you want to think of where you're at as a parent, what you're doing as a parent is impacted by how you were raised and how your own parents were raised. That's all going to have a factor into the tools that you have in raising your child. And if you're like, oh my gosh, you know, if, if that idea makes you nervous, it's like approaching it with a sense of calm and saying, it's okay, because I have a power to choose the words I say, the actions I do in my home and trust that that is where you can make a really significant difference as you help your child make a better sense of the world. So, you know, what things that you want to stop would be like what this study found was that as the as the body mass index increased, kids were encouraged not only to diet and restrict their food, which is malnourishment at any size and is inadequate for their growth and nutrition needs, but they were also encouraged and engaged in disordered eating habits, whether that was use of laxatives or over-exercising. And so, you know, we really got to think about that, that this is a child and that it was weight dependent, right? So as the BMI climbed, they were encouraged to do these things that we would say, this is eating disorder behavior, right? But it was encouraged because of the body weight. And I think that's, that's the big lesson, right? If we can all understand and accept that we have these standards of worthiness and who is valuable, who is worthy, and who gets access to health. And if you're at the higher BMI, you lack those privileges. And so it makes sense, right? If you're a parent, it's like, but I don't want, you know, like I was teased when I was a kid and I don't want my child to have to deal with that. Or, you know, I've seen teasing in the school or even, even accepting, wow, when I come to think of it, I make judgments about people based on their size. And that could, we could carry a lot of shame about that. Like, right. Cause we don't want to be bad people either or do the wrong thing either. But I think if we could stop with some sense of acceptance of these are my fears, these are the things I think about, right. But what if in my own mind, I followed the belief that all bodies are good all bodies deserve to be respected and that I don't really know anything about anyone else's health or wellness or what they have access to or what they might be dealing with based on any size or shape of body. That if I could work with my own beliefs and what I have control over in my home, right? So then I could teach my child you know, that in this house, we believe that all bodies are good. And so, you know, now we're at the grocery store and what might be developmentally appropriate for a four-year-old to point at a stranger and say that person's fat, right? To then say, yeah, you're right. That person is fat. And you know what, honey? There's nothing wrong with fat. All people are good, right? It's like, Something like that, that it's, you know, a parent usually says, wow, Rebecca, now that you say it like that, it sounds easy. To know why that that doesn't come out naturally is not our fault. It's that we've been conditioned to believe that that is something that if we don't exercise enough and we eat too much, that a higher weight is our destiny when that's not necessarily true because much like height, so height is the highest genetically heritable percentage. So it's 80 some percent plus your height is determined by your genetics. And weight is the second highest, 70 to 80%, more than most chronic diseases or more than most anything else you can think of. So if we just allowed ourselves, you know, all bodies are good, all bodies should be respected. And you know, that health is a gift, but it's not a guarantee for anyone at any size. And so- Exactly, I love that. Yeah. Say that again. Oh, well, health is a gift, but health it's is a gift. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, is, it is, you know, it's also a dynamic thing, you know, as, I'm, I'm as my too. age is climbing up, you know, and I notice some more rickety joints or, you know, just different things. I've had this whole new relationship with myself and like, how do I want to age? It was like the second I turned 40, social media knew and I was getting all the anti wrinkle creams and I was like, oh, here it goes, you know? And it's just, <laughs> wait till you turn 50. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it only gets worse, right? But, you know, I feel like it's there's like, also this like chutzpah that happens where you're just like, you know, I'm done. You know, I am done yeah. fighting the mess, you know, like I'm done like saying I'm not good enough. 
and yeah. so that you can kind of move forward in these really positive ways. And so anyway, I just, I do want to acknowledge that this stuff is really hard because unless we've been raised with the language to resist culture and to resist body shame, it's a tough thing to fight and we fight it on a daily basis. And, and I would just encourage you, if there's listeners who are, you know, you're genetically at a higher weight, or you feel like you've struggled with your, your weight your whole life and you really feel at a loss, like, how am I going to protect my kids? I really want to say to you that culture really is the problem here and that, yes, I want to give you the tools to resist that. But really what we should be asking is for every person who has a child or who interacts with children or who just cares about the next generation, we need to ask everyone to do better. And that's going to include people who profit off of a hundred billion dollar plus a year dieting industry. You know, we mm-hmm. have to ask people to have a common humanity and in our homes and in our communities and in the products we buy, treat everyone with respect don't make judgments about people, about their health or their worthiness, what they put on their plates, how much they exercise, just don't judge <laughs> and, yeah. and practice compassion in your own home and try to do well, you know, try to do well, but don't try to be perfect and don't shame or judge because it's really not going to help. And it really could likely lead to harm to our emotional well-being. It's interesting because I'm very aware of the assumptions that are made just by looking at somebody. And I was watching one of the music awards last night and there was a celebrity on who was a larger woman. And, you know, somebody in my like arena of viewers made an assumption about her health and a negative assumption about her health. And it just strikes me as how easy and willing we are to judge a book by its cover. Mm -hmm. And it's rampant. It's it's rampant. Everywhere. And I think it's, so emotional labor is a real thing. And what is that? What is emotional labor? That is the effort that we put into helping to change somebody else's perspective. So, you know, it's all the things that we have to think about. So, so very interestingly, like, Higher weight people have to do a lot more emotional labor to show up at the gym. Mm-hmm. So, for example, I, you know, I have a personal trainer who is higher weight, right? And it's like mm-hmm. people will mistake her for like the beginner. And she's like, no, I'm the trainer, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's like you have to do more emotional labor just to exercise because you might get this uninvited congratulations. Great job. Keep it up. And, and the thinner person might be intending to be helpful there right? I want to encourage and motivate that person to keep going. So it's actually a microaggression, right? Because the person didn't need your congratulations. You have no idea of where they're at in their health journey. And maybe they just want to exercise and be left alone. But, you know, like if you think about it, we will make these assumptions and judgments about a person's health or how much they exercise or don't. And that's a person's individual choice anyway. But when we assign these assumptions, I mean, think about how much harder it must be. I mean, even down to the exercise gear, right? Are they making workout outfits that fit higher weight bodies comfortably that are affordable and preferably not in black, right? And that's another example of a systemic issue of, you know, you know, if somebody isn't exercising, there could be real reasons why down to how much time they have, how much interest they have, having comfortable clothes that fit. So it really is just helping people who have more privilege understand that there could be a lot of different barriers, but also to have some compassion for when you have thin privilege, you know, you don't have to think about, am I going to fit in the airplane seat? Is anybody going to mock me when I'm exercising today? Am I going to go to the doctor and are they going to shame me even though I have been making strides in my eating patterns and I feel good? Is it good enough so I don't get a lecture? And this is all extra emotional labor that you have to do when you're at a higher weight. So when I when I was talking about that, you know, I was talking about this idea of, how we can choose to say something, you know, you could decide, Hey, do I have the emotional labor to say something? And if I do, what should I say? And and I want to encourage more people to say something because it's usually our fear. We let it go 
But when we do, we miss an opportunity to kind of shift that culture forward. You can say something as simple as, you know, I don't think we can really know what her health and wellness is like. I really appreciate the quality of her voice and she was very entertaining. So it could just be a gentle challenge to the that bash or shame. And I tend to take a a kind approach, but there's nothing wrong with a little bit of anger. Like if you feel angry about it, just say, you know what? I really think that what you're saying is unhelpful. And maybe this would be more likely if we're kind of coming to defense of our child or something like that, where I don't want to say, oh, you must be nice in order to do some emotional labor. Like sometimes a little bit of anger is warranted as well. But, you know, I would encourage listeners, like when you see something that just doesn't sound right, you know, if you think like either your personal feelings are hurt or your child's feelings are hurt, or like, you know, I suspect that this is a shaming judgment that is really unhelpful. A good question you can even ask yourself is like, would I want my child to hear this comment? Not that you always have to respond, but I think we let a lot of stuff fly under the radar without a response. And what it has to do with is we're, we're afraid to be vulnerable because we don't, we don't want to, you know, get into a fight with somebody or create problems or be seen as like the rebel rouser. But as you know, one of my favorites, Brene Brown would say is like, you've got to be in the arena, you know, right. like that is how you create real change. So, well, for the record, I did say, I don't think we can make an assumption about this person's health. Mm-hmm. And What I got back was, come on, you can't tell me that she's not healthy. (laughs) Yeah. Was this in in an online forum by chance? No, it was not. It was an in-person forum of a group of us watching. And it it was a little, you know, I said, you can't make an assumption. And they said, well, you can't tell me that there's not some health issues there. Yeah. Well, and and then what I I feel like. It was really like that, that flashing. And I think a lot of people experience that. Mm-hmm. It's hard, isn't it? Like, because yes, that hurts. it's hard. You know, it, it, it like hurts your own feelings too. I mean, I feel- well, it's like I wanted to say, you do you. Like, why are you so worried about somebody else's body? Mm-hmm. Well, psychological science would say that it's because they're dealing with their own insecurities. And so in social comparison theory, we have the tendency to compare up or compare down. So she might be comparing up because here's this famous singer who probably got into all the parties and is making money, you know, and so in that comparison up, you feel inadequate. And so if I can say something that helps me feel better, then that's what I need to do. So I think you're right with the you do you comment. I also love, you know, hey, we can agree to disagree, but if you ever want to really talk about health and weight, I'm happy to share information with you. And I think that's another great thing to do is like have conversations about possible future conversations. Because I'm sure mm-hmm. people are like, hey, I'm just trying to watch some awards and eat some popcorn here. <laughs> you know, can you guys stop fighting? And so I get that, yeah. right? But, you know, yeah. it's it's just a really, it is so deeply embedded, but that's where I like acceptance, right? If we can mm-hmm. accept that culture isn't perfect and we're, and we're humans and, you know, that, that there's these deep standards that come with health and wellness that are just deeply rooted. I think that what we could say is, look, you know, I'm waking up today. I'm a parent who is just trying to do the best she can with what she has. How can I learn and grow? What can I do for my child to help foster compassion and resilience and love and kindness? Just these these values that we really care about. And when we're doing that, we've got to include things like what we're talking about, which is appearance privilege. And it starts as soon as you can, right? The second my three-year-old mentioned fat in a fun and playful way, I just smile and say, oh, you're noticing your belly and mommy's belly. And they said, squish, squish. And, you know, it's like, yeah, I love your belly. I love mine too. And honey, there's nothing wrong with fat. And it was it was not the time to whip out the PowerPoint for three. It was just a little thing that was really more for me 
Right. Then when the question about cheeseburgers, you know, I, you know, I said, honey, if mom and dad gives it to you, you can trust that, you know, that it's good. And that's not what we do in this house about individual foods, you know, but it was interesting. The next morning I gave her one of her favorites, which is yogurt with, and I put some chocolate chips on it. And it's like a plain yogurt. Sometimes I put mix a little bit of plain and vanilla, you know, but she likes, she loves chocolate, everything, throw some chocolate chips in there. She pushed it away. And uh, she goes, yeah, the teacher said that chocolate was a junk food too. And so the, the fact that it really affected her the next morning, and she is a highly sensitive child. And I said, oh, honey. And I was like, can we think of something good about this? And, and she said, well, I like the taste of it. I was like, yeah, you know, what else? And I was like, what is it that food does? And she's like, well, it gives me energy. And I, you know, and I reinforce that and how she likes her ballet and that, you know, energy to think and play. And that was all it took. She happily ate her chocolate chip yogurt. And, you know, the gym teacher, I, I have to say, I was really pleased with the response. I, I started out by reaching out to her teacher with it, just a kind and gentle email. And she knew that what I do and, and everything. And I said, you know, I'd love to get connected with the gym teachers to have a conversation and pass my name. The gym teacher called and said, I would never want to do anything to harm a child. I have an 11 month old myself. Yes. Can we please talk about this? So we set up a meeting to have this conversation and you know, essentially he said, I I would like to collaborate, you know, the next one is about balanced eating. Can you give me some advice? And so was able to give him some support. And he even went above and beyond and went into her classroom and unpacked his lunchbox to show everyone his cookie, you know, (laughs) and he kind of explained, you know, this is my favorite. I really look forward to the cookie and I love it. And look at all these different parts. And so I just said, you don't have to do anything. I work with my daughter, but sure, anything you want, want to do to create a positive conversation. And he said, when he walked in the room, that Audrey sat kind of nestled in right in front and raised her hand and goes, my mom said, all foods are good. Food. <laughs> That's perfect. So, you know, and, and, and we'll have these stories. We hear stories about how the dentist comes in and be like, sugar, wash your teeth, kids, like to three or four year olds. And so, you know, I kind of take this phrase. It's like the feeling we get is like, Oh, please don't screw up my kid, you know? And, and that, that, that is a real thing as I'm sure your listeners are, you know, they care about health and well-being, and they are thinking about nutrition, you know, but they also want to, you know, what do we do about chips and cookies and all these other things in like reasonable ways as you're figuring this out for your family, you're going to run into things in culture that you feel like are problematic back to that emotional labor piece. You can stop and think, do I have the energy? Is this the right person who I think with some education and boundaries will make a meaningful difference in the relationship with my child and in my child's life? You know, it's not about you'll exhaust yourself if you think that you're going to figure out how to put goop out of business. Like (laughs) you will exhaust yourself. So you really want to just think, you know, like let your own family values evolve Try to get clear on how you feel good about how you're doing it in your house. And you you just day to day, you do the best you can with what you have with this kindness and compassion, flexible and healthy eating patterns that is really away from good or bad foods, really away from body shaming or making judgments. And you'll see you're just teaching your kids a different way of thinking, living and being in the world that is going to do less harm whether you are the family who genetically just have a larger frame, bigger muscles and bones and a higher BMI, or you happen genetically be on the leaner side. And, you know, what we want to do is create a better world for all folks. And that means that we're inclusive of all weights, even if it's the higher weight person who ends up with an eating disorder, how do we help them build the better life by creating less harm. Or if somebody does get a diabetes diagnosis one day, you know, there's many, many factors. And if we ever get that diagnosis, trust that there are good things we can do to take care of ourselves. And there are good medicines. And even at any point in our life, when we decide that we want to change our habits, doing that from a place of love is what I think is key. But I mean, if you think about it, it's like we get this message in our culture that somehow we're never supposed to die, 
And that means that we have to do everything we can, every action to preserve our health. And that actually creates a lot of stress and anxiety. I mean, when when Whole30, I mean, which is a diet in disguise, and I'm sorry if you love Whole30 listeners, but it really is a diet in disguise. It says every bite of food either adds to your health or takes away from it. That is not scientific and it is unhelpful. You don't need to follow a diet for weight control. If somebody's, we follow healthy eating patterns and change you know, the way we relate to food by focusing on taste and pleasure and maybe, you know, working on some like boredom eating, right? Kind of curbing some of that so that we feel good about, you know, what we're eating in a way that we can do forever. With that kind of mindset, we don't need to freak out if there's a birthday party and someone's serving cake. So Rebecca, I want to ask you a couple, if we have a couple of minutes here to, I want to ask you a couple of questions from my Facebook group members. And they are, these are parent questions that are more specific around, you know, how to handle situations or what to say. So the first one is my daughter recently started talking about different bodies. She wants to know why some people have bigger bodies and is not satisfied with the quote unquote, everyone is different explanation. How can I explain the people in our lives who aren't taking the best care of themselves? There is so much nuance. And I also worry about her repeating what I say or asking them directly. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and so that was from one group member. Okay. Because I don't know if you noticed, but I I feel like I saw sort of two different challenges in that question. So I'm going to break it out into two parts. Because the first thing that I want to challenge is like she talks about how do you talk about people who are larger, you know, besides all bodies are good or everybody's different. Right. And I, I, I don't exactly know, but I suspect that in, in her family, there's a, an association with people who are larger, who are maybe also not taking care of themselves. And so that's, that's kind of reinforcing, Hey, someone who doesn't take care of themselves is going to be at a higher weight. In the first part of the question, you know, besides the all bodies are good reinforcement, you know, I think there are some deeper things that you could do. I think that you could look at, you know, try to think of your child's interests. So for example, if they like any kind of sport at all, might they know or be interested in Serena Williams? And Serena Williams has some great quotes about being an athlete and a mom and about her body because she's been, you know, commented on about her appearance. You know, so so kind of like connecting into something that connects to your child's interests or in a way in which there's someone or something that they admire that can associate like a really empowering and positive viewpoint associated with someone that they admire about bodies. And so that would be just one example for a track where you could go down. I also think depending on an age appropriate level and what they're learning about science, actually helping them understand like genetics, right? So whether that's, hey, here's where babies come from, right? And so it's like, you know, the, we have this genetic material and how they come together sets a lot of things for us. So even, you know, maybe explaining that there are different frames for bodies, like you know, like for example, you know, even different regions of the world, right? So somebody from China might be shorter and have a smaller frame because how their genetics passed on, they tend to have more smaller frames and a shorter height, right? And then, you know, so helping them to understand that there are just in our skeletons, small, medium, and large frames, and that a larger frame bone structure is going to need larger muscles to support that. And that those things are going to contribute to weight as well as somebody's body fat. And, you know, so again, tackle that at the different age appropriate levels, but it's just, it's more detailed than the brush off, like all bodies are good. And look, I think we should be really honest too and say, you know, it's up to individuals to make the choices that work for them in their lives. And so it's most important that we think about what helps make our life better as a person and in our family. And there may be people 
we love really, really deeply. And, you know, I know you're noticing that we're with them at this picnic and maybe they've, they've made an imbalanced plate or they've eat, they've gone to the buffet, they've been grazing, you know, just something that the child is noticing. It's like, you know, I appreciate that you noticed that and that you brought that to me. You know, I, what I want to say to you is that it's important that we take care of ourselves and that this family member, that we love them no matter what, you know, and that that person is in charge of their body, how hungry they are, the choices they make. And we can care about them and trust that they're doing what they want to do to care for their well-being, even if we would do something different. It's important that we respect them and love them no matter what. And so that's what I would direct to a child. I know I want to empathize with this member too, because I know how it feels where you have all the information and you've shared the information, you've given the motivation, you've given all the tools. And yet this person who you love deeply, who you wish you could just magically wave a wand and boom, they'd have a different mindset and different set of habits. The reality of it is, is you can never do that no matter how badly you want. And so instead, what you want to do is change how you relate to this person and how you feel about their behaviors and actions and choices. You might separately, if you care deeply for the emotional labor, have a conversation and say, you know, I know some things about health and wellness that really helped me in my life. And I just want you to know if you ever have questions, if you think I might be able to help in any way, you know, no, no judgment at all. I'm, I'm happy to share what I know or what I think or help point you to some resources. And, and that is the furthest I would take it because the second you dive in with you should and whatever's, trust me, people have heard it before. And that shame, you end up creating a shame spiral for them, which makes it even less likely that they have any sort of internal motivation to trust that you have information or resources for them or trust that they should put effort into their own changes. It's kind of like, let people live. Even if you deeply feel that they're not exercising and they're not eating right, even if you feel angry by that, let them live, you know? Yeah, good. Let them live. <laughs> Question number two, what can I say to others who are commenting on my daughter's body? I know I can't shelter her from these comments forever. Mm -hmm. Should I talk to her about it? Mm -hmm. So... Anyone, so if you're in the room and someone is making a comment on your daughter's body, whether or not your daughter is around, for me, my tip is that's like a hard stop. You know, that's a hard stop and a firm boundary. I don't care. It could be the president or I don't know, the, the queen, whoever, <laughs> you know, your, your idol or someone you really don't want to hurt. You know, you can say, look we do not comment on other people's bodies. And I'm going to have to ask you to never say anything about my daughter's body ever again, you know, and just keep it simple, but it is a firm, hard stop. We don't do that here. You know, you might get some pushback in that case and any type of pushback. This is where I would delay the conversation. And I would just say, I'm happy to talk to you more about it at another time and place. But we're going to walk away now and we can discuss this later and just get out of the situation. If your daughter happens to be around in that comment, I would just take a minute and say, hey, let's go. Let's go talk for a second. And, you know, say it's really important in our family that we do not comment on appearances. And this is something that I wanted to make sure that the person who made a mistake knew about. I'll make sure that we settle things out later, but I just want to check in with you. Are you okay? How do you feel right now? And just because it may be that, again, right then and there is not the right time or place to go into a deep processing of, but I think that if they're around and something happens, it just kind of taken a step back, you know, oh no, mom, you know, I am okay. I'd be like, all right, well, I would like to talk about this at another time. And that way, First of all, you get some time to actually think about what you want to say and what you want to do, but it allows you to just kind of feel something that was jarring, 
take a deep breath. It's going to be okay. Jump into action. Know that your child has some amount of resilience to it and can move on and socialize and have fun. And then when you have the time for one-on-one conversation, because, and again, it will, how deep you go depends on age, but because daughter was mentioned, I mean, we're talking feminism, sexism, culture, you know, what it means to be a girl and woman, you know, like can be part of a lot of conversation. Exactly. Yeah. There's a lot there. Well, and I also, I really like that you are saying that parents can just put the hard stop right there. Like I, I want to tell, you know, listeners out there, don't be afraid to say that's not okay. And I don't want to hear any more about that. You know, we don't do this. A hard stop. It is okay to let the big mama bear come out and just say, we're not doing this. Thanks. But no yeah. Thanks. And you know, somehow, sometimes the quick hard stop is also the best because it lets them know immediately that there's a problem. And the reality is they might get hurt by that. But by putting in the hard stop and even, you know, like I said, you might get a pushback. We'll talk later. We're going to walk away now, right? That What that does, it also does help to mitigate that person's shame spiral because it like in my mind, right? I'm like, how could you ever? And don't you know eating disorders and body image and you suck, right? Like in my mind, I am like yelling at the person. And at the same time, if I'm in this social situation, I also don't want to be the kind of person who does that. So the firm, hard stop, we don't do that, you know, and not that you need to run away at first, but we don't do that. Don't ever do this again. And if any kind of response back, hopefully you get a, I'm sorry, and that's okay. We can talk about it later. Then maybe you don't need to walk away. But if they kind of give this, why? Oh, I didn't mean it. I wasn't serious. It was a joke. None of that crap matters. They did it. It was an offensive problem that needs to get addressed just at a later date. And I also have this phrase that helps people. It's like, is this a post-it person? So if you had a post-it and you had to write the names of people who mattered, if that person was a post-it person, then I would say definitely at some point you're going to need to set some firm boundaries of do's and don'ts or else we don't have a relationship here. But, you know, I mean, I've been there at those social parties and something comes out of someone's mouth and you're like, really? And what you really learned is like, yep, you're not going to become a friend and I'm going to really, um, you know, I'm not going to play date with you. And so you might be like, eh, you know, that's not really helpful conversation for me. And you just kind of like back away, and, you know, like that also might be enough because that's not a post-it person. You don't have to give the emotional labor, but you could still do the hard stop and then just you know, now, you know, then, then your other firmness is like, you know, you probably, you know, don't want to give this person many chances. And if it comes up that the daughter has a relationship that she really wants to foster before you let it move forward, I would definitely have a conversation with the other parent. And, you know, it can be simple, but the boundaries are so important because people need to know the language for what it takes to be able to be around you. And if they can't respect it, then they need to go. What can you say when your child says negative comments about their own body? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, one thing I hate, I hate my yeah. stomach. Yeah. You know, my arms are so fat. What, what does a parent say when their child says that about their own body? So one thing that really sucks about this is as the parent, there's almost nothing that you could say that's really going to make a difference because, oh, you have to say that you're my mom, you know? So again, I would take it back to some things are unfortunately like developmentally kind of appropriate, especially around puberty and your body is changing. That social comparison, kids do compare themselves. There's a normal stage of child development really from like 11 on where kids are unraveling from their parents in that sort of, I want to cuddle with you all the time way. And they're really trying to find their own groups. And so you want your child to find social groups where they feel they can fit in. You know, you would be more worried if they did not have a social group, but whatever social group, like I was in a mean girl social group for sure. Right. And that social group is going to have an influence or they might you know, I did a lot of comparing to my friends. If you're lucky enough that your child verbalized a body dissatisfaction to you, because understand that they're going to be dissatisfied. Some of it is just developmentally appropriate where they're doing this comparison. If you're lucky to hear it or witness it, you might say something like, 
you know, I heard you say this comment and I want to let you know that of course I'm your mom and you're, you expect me to hear that I love you no matter what. And that is true. But what I really want you to take away from this is that it's less about having that negative thought come through, you know, a judgment about, about your appearance. It's, it's understandable that you might have a negative thought, but I'd like you to think about how is this helpful? You know, how does that thought help me show up for my friends, show up for my schoolwork, show up for my activities that I care about? Because you're at an age now where you really can stop and think if this thought doesn't help me feel happy or loved or have more joy, that, then I don't need to respond to that. I can just notice it and kind of let it go. And, and so that is like, that would be an amazing feat if you could accomplish that. So where you just kind of jump in and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that you think that I'm supposed to say this. And yes, that's true. Because I do believe I love you no matter what. And at the same time, this is what I want you to challenge. And so what that does is it separates the, you know, say like the most kind of ideal body conforming parents from jumping into the the worst trap, which is you're not fat and you're not this, because it doesn't matter how you see them. It matters how they see themselves. And also when you're in the more, you know, mainstream thin conforming group and you say you're not fat, you continue to marginalize the fat kids, you know, that the daughter may have a higher weight friend who, you know, and so that's just why you just don't even want to go there. And instead, it's like when you see that response, it's like that works for the parents who who know that their child is following their growth curve and who is just on the larger side, no matter what their habits are. You know, you've done your work in helping them build healthy eating patterns and preferences, but like they still got to be able to go out and have pizza or fast food with their friends, right? And when you, as you do your job with that, you still encourage activity and it's like their size is their size, right? You want to help them if they're having a bad body moment about their belly. Say, so you know what? Yep, we're going on this trip or you're going with your friends on this camp and there's going to be pool or beach. I want to help you feel as comfortable as you can. You know, let me know what you need and and provide the resources for like, you know, a comfortable fitting swimsuit and and know like, hey, like you might feel uncomfortable in certain situations and, and that's okay to feel uncomfortable. What can I do to help provide you with the resources to try to make you feel as comfortable as possible? And when you feel uncomfortable, what are you going to do with those thoughts? And that's where, because of your teaching, you help them just identify that it's unhelpful and that they want to go on with their life and enjoy the beach or pool, enjoy their friends. And, you know, I am worthy even when I feel, you know, gross or disgusting. And again, a lot of that is developmentally appropriate. Or they might say, oh, but, you know, I did eat a lot of fries. And, and so if they're talking to you more about it, then you can help them say, you know what? Well, sometimes we eat a little bit more fries than 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 we typically do. That's okay. We're going to digest that and move on. You know, just helping them build this dialogue of resilience, and it's really what body kindness does and the philosophy in the book. And so, when you do that for yourself, it's like you learn how to teach that to your kids. That's a really, it's a great note to end on. It's a wonderful philosophy, and I think you know this has been so helpful in terms of just understanding sort of the typical things that children will go through, because a lot of this is sort of typical developmental stuff and, and having the phrases and the approaches to handle those as parents without feeling like it's going to be a pathological path to, you know, something terrible down the road, that, that some of this is just normal and, and how you handle it really can matter quite a bit to your child. So very helpful. Tell us quickly about body kindness and how and where people can connect with you. Rebecca. Sure. So if you go to bodykindnessbook.com, there is a free kind of get started mini course that you can do. So I highly recommend that. And then the book is available wherever you get your books and audiobooks and everything like that. So I'd love for you to check that out. And I'm just so grateful for the time and the conversation today. And I'm really grateful for the listeners 
who are just hearing something new and are like, you know, I think I might try try things a little bit differently. Like that is the most important thing that you're learning and growing and that you stay fully committed to enhancing your own well-being and the well-being of the people in your family. That is what is truly going to help everyone create a better life. It's not about being perfect because no human is. But it's about trying to do a little bit better and feel a little bit better about the way we move and live and exist in the world. Rebecca, what does it mean to you to be nourished? Mm. I think what it means to me is that even when it's really, really hard, that I can take my hands and put them on my heart and say, it's okay. Because that in my hardest moment to be able to connect and say, it's okay. That's how I trust that the next moment and the next step and the next choice and the next action will lead to it becoming okay. So if I'm nourished I am fully committed to being there for myself, even when it feels impossible. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Thanks for having me. Okay, folks, there you have it. I hope this episode gave you lots of things to think about and ponder. You are key to helping your child accept herself or himself inside and out. The show notes and all the links we talked about are available over at jillcastle.com forward slash 094. Head on over to iTunes to rate, review, leave a comment about this podcast. If you have a scenario, a question, or some insight you want to share, go ahead and comment on the podcast show notes over at jillcastle.com forward slash 094, or snag me on Facebook, Instagram, or email me. I'll do my best to reply. Next up on The Nourished Child is Dr. Laura Jana, who is on the show to talk about her book and her expertise, The Brain. Specifically, her book is called The Toddler Brain, and we are talking about all the different things we need to be thinking about when it comes to brain development in young children. So that's all she wrote, folks. That's all I've got for you this week. Don't forget to give that child in your life a loving squeeze today. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the Nourish Child Podcast, where the number one goal is to help you grow a nourished child inside and out. <laughs>